My name is Steve Walsh. I'm a research biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, and today I am going to be talking about the aquatic fauna of Florida karst. So to give you an overview of the talk, I'll begin with talking a little bit about the importance of karst ecosystems and the fauna. I'll cover various aspects about biological sampling, including some of the methods that we apply, types of analyses, I'll give you some uh, limited results of various studies and uh, some guide to some resources um, that are important to biologists in doing this type of work. A large part of my talk will be sort of, sort of a photo gallery of major faunal groups. I'll talk a little bit about benthic macroinvertebrates, our unique subterranean fauna, fishes, my area of expertise, a little bit about other vertebrates, and I'll end the talk uh, talking about invasive species. So this is a map of karst regions of the world shown in red or uh, orangish color um, from this publication in 2007. And globally, you'll notice that <clears throat> karstic regions of the world are generally, generally um, a greatest concentration in the Northern hemisphere particularly in Asia and Europe, and of course in North America. And if we look at the United States specifically, these are the karstic, primary karstic regions of the US. And I just wanna point out a few of the uh, major areas. Um, first of all, you'll <clears throat> notice that the biggest concentration of large uh, um, karst areas are in the central and eastern US particularly in uh, the Ozarks and the interior highlands of Kentucky and Tennessee, the Appalachians, the Edwards Aquifer in Texas, and then of course in Florida, primarily associated with the Florida Aquifer. So we have in Florida um, and Georgia, portions of Alabama and South Carolina, we have uh, the largest um, area of karst in the coastal plain. And uh, this is where we'll, I'll be focusing the talk on the aquatic and, and semi-aquatic and terrestrial faunas that are associated primarily with this um, unique karst uh, region. So visitors to Florida Springs are generally um, most impressed by the uh, unique uh, uh, iconic species that we have of wildlife and flora. Um, I'm gonna be just specifically talking about the fauna. Hopefully you've uh, already seen the talk on uh, Florida vegetation, so I won't say much about that, but um, our springs are unique in terms of uh, our fauna, and, and this is what really draws many visitors to our spring systems. So just to address some of the primary ecological value of springs to begin with, um, first of all, these are unique aquatic environments across the landscape. And they maintain continuous stream-based flows, which is important for the communities that are associated with these habitats. And in terms of the um, substrate, the extensive beds of vegetation are important uh, habitats for the aquatic organisms, the, the plants and anim the animals that are associated with them. And this is the nutrient resource base for the entire um, food chain. We also have uh, some unique endemic faunas, endemic being uh, organisms that are confined to these particular um, regions. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of our um, endemic organisms, particularly uh, snails and, and our cave fauna. And finally, um, one of the important other ecological values of springs is that they provide thermal refugia for species such as manatees and striped bass. So why do we study springs biology? Well, in studying springs biology, we can see changes that occur in terms of the hydrology and water quality. These are manifested in uh, community changes from the bottom of the trophic level um, on up the food chain to the top of the trophic level. 
So typically, um, if we think about um, historically uh, healthy springs, we had abundant um, macrophytes and associated with those macrophytes are the aquatic fauna. And what we're seeing, of course, today with changes uh, in terms of nutrient inputs, in terms of flows and the combination of, of, of those factors are changes that uh, really dramatically affect these uh, communities. So you'll see um, uh, a domination of um, some of these communities by algae and a loss of macrophytes. And this has uh, significant consequences for the entire faunal communities. So I wanna just uh, discuss a little bit about some of the methodology that uh, ecologists use to sample um, animals in these habitats. We have two sort of general categories, qualitative and quantitative or semi-quantitative means. Uh, qualitative are things such as um, direct visual observation or um, we do use some types of gears that are not particularly quantitative. And then we have some gear types um, that are uh, fairly quantitative that allow us to um, more carefully evaluate changes to, to communities. So here uh, I'm illustrating some of the different um, gears and methods that are used to sample aquatic organisms. On the left-hand side, we have different types of nets that are used for sampling invertebrates. Um, shown here is a ponar dredge. This is a quantitative uh, method of sampling the substrate. It, it samples a fixed volume of the substrate and the, in, the invertebrates that are collected by those means are then returned to the laboratory and can be enumerated. Uh, we have a manual uh, survey for mussels. We have um, seines that are used for fish, um, direct observations such as scuba or snorkeling, and then also for fish, we use electrofishing. This is a quantitative means for sampling. Electrofishing either in, from a boat or using a backpack electrofisher. And this is a non-lethal method. Uh, it stuns fish, but they recover if it's done properly. And it uh, can be used to quantify uh, fish communities. Ecologists use a number of different uh, statistical uh, methods for um, evaluating uh, aquatic communities, uh, not just aquatic communities, any community. And these are some of the types of statistical metrics that are used by ecologists. So we may simply be interested in the presence or the absence, the occurrence of different species. Uh, but more often we're interested in things such as how many different species are there, the taxonomic richness, or the abundance of different particular species, maybe even the relative abundance of a combination of the different species. And then more sophisticated statistical approaches that involve various indices, again, of looking at a combination of taxonomic richness and abundance. So I'll begin with talking about um, the invertebrates within uh, spring systems. The invertebrates are the most diverse uh, of our uh, animals, of our aquatic animals. And uh, in some cases, they're also among the most um, imperiled and they also are important indicator organisms for general aquatic health. So benthic macroinvertebrates um, play uh, play several important ecological roles in terms of our, our spring communities. First of all, they are the base of the food chain. They're important primary consumers. That is, they're herbivores that feed, that, that feed on plants and convert that plant biomass into animal biomass. And because of their species richness and abundance, their key elements in terms of the faunal biodiversity, much more diverse than our vertebrates, and the, they also include key grazers that form intermediate predators, which of course serve as food for uh, other aquatic animals higher up in the food chain. So I just wanna go briefly through some of the major taxonomic categories of benthic 
macroinvertebrates that are uh, examined by ecologists interested in assessing the health of these systems. Beginning with the annelids, commonly thought of as worms, so we have multi-segmented annelids, the polychaetes, we have things like leeches, the heridinia, and these are very diverse within these systems. We have two major categories of mollusks, the gastropods, the snails shown at the top, and the bivalves, the mussels shown at the bottom. Many of our gastropods in particular are important grazers um, on, uh, on periphyton and um, epilimnetic uh, epil uh, organisms in these systems. The bivalves are filter feeders, and I'll talk a little bit about each of these groups. I want to start with uh, a particular group of interest in Florida springs of snails, the uh, the hydrobeids, commonly known as silt snails. These are very diminutive snails. They're on the order of just a few millimeters in size, but they're also some very important endemic species in different springs, and I'll show you the distribution of some in, in a minute. Um, so these uh, six snails shown at the top are different hydrobeids, uh, a, a very diverse family of snails uh, globally. We also have uh, the pleurosaurids. These are native um, native snails, particularly of the genus Elemia. And uh, these are the snails that you will see um, in high densities when you visit springs. You'll see them covering uh, the sand substrate or on the vegetation. We also have a few species of non-native snails. But looking at the distribution of some of the hydrobeid snails, these are a few of the species and the springs that they're found in, particularly in the Sons Basin. And uh, we have one in the, in the Itchituckney and one over in the Crystal River. And these are all endemic hydrobeids. That is, they're confined to these single spring systems. And in some cases have a very limited distribution. So for instance, the um, Itchituckney salt snail, Floridorbia mica, is confined to uh, an, a very small area of literally a, a few square meters within the Itchituckney. So it has one of the smallest ranges of, of any of our uh, snails, even throughout the United States. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about mussels, in particular because mussels, freshwater mussels of the family Unionidae in North America have a unique life history. The adults, of course, are embedded in the substrate and they're filter feeders. Um, and when it comes time to reproduce, males will release their gametes into the water column and the females will collect those gametes. And with once the females um, have fertilized their eggs, they release those um, larvae as what are called glycidia. These, these larvae then are parasitic on a fish host. So they become parasitic on the fish host and they develop usually on the gills, but perhaps also on the, the fins or on the skin. And they um, begin their growth and development until they become juvenile mussels, at which time they then fall off of the uh, fish host and settle into the substrate and then begin to grow into an adult. Um, what's particularly interesting in this uh, life history uh, is the anatomy of the females in terms of um, attracting a fish host to disperse the glycidia, we've discovered that, or ecologists have discovered it, particularly in relatively recent years, a tremendous diversity of uh, adaptations involving uh, use of um, what we consider a lure to attract its host. And so here are some examples of different types of um, lures that these mussels have evolved. And in many cases, they resemble aquatic invertebrates or small fish in order to attract a potential predator, predatory host. And so I'll show you a short video clip of a species that um, will be uh, using its mantle to try to attract a fish host. 
So here you can see this muscle embedded in the sand. It's a female with her mantle exposed above the surface of the sand. And you'll see these fish darting in, um, trying to um, uh, attack this, what appears to be a, a prey item to them. And at some point then the female will release those glycidia and they become attached to the gills of the fish. Okay, moving on to the next um, big category of benthic macroinvertebrates are the crustaceans. Um, most people are familiar with our decapod crustaceans, the crayfishes and the um, shrimps. But we also have these other groups, the amphipods, commonly known as uh, scuds or side swimmers, the isopods, commonly known as pill bugs. And the group of benthic macroinvertebrates that uh, constitutes the greatest species richness are the insects. There's many different uh, major groups of insects. And when we think about insects in, in spring and aquatic habitats, it's important to realize that most of these groups <clears throat> um, are, have a bimodal uh, life history. That is, they have an aquatic larval stage and then they have a, a terrestrial or an aerial adult stage. But to aquatic ecologists, we're most interested in the larval stages um, because these, these are the ones that are in the water, typically associated with the benth benthic substrate. And so shown here are some of the major groups up on the upper left are the ephemeropterans. These are mayfly. In the lower left are plecopterans. These are stoneflies. In the middle, we have the dipterans. These are the true flies, um, including things such as biting midges, which you think of as noceums, um, mosquitoes, and, and, and other uh, related taxa. Um, in the upper right, we have the trichopterans. These are caddis fly. The larvae are very unique. They, um, they accumulate um, material from, the, from their environment, such as small uh, gravel or or small twigs, and they build a case that they encase themselves in, and they uh, filter feed in the water column. And then uh, this last group, the odonates, these are the um, mayfly and drag, I'm, I'm sorry, the dragonfly and damselfly larvae. So I wanna talk just a little bit about some methods that are used in sampling macroinvertebrates in order to assess ecological health. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection uses this approach to um, determine what they call a stream condition index or SCI. This is a metric, a multi-metric index that's used to evaluate the overall health of stream systems. And it involves sampling using a, 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 a D net, a sweep net, sampling across different habitats to collect invertebrates that are then subsampled, returned to the laboratory, and they're enumerated into different functional guilds. And these different functional guilds <clears throat> are indicates, indications of how uh, healthy a particular stream habitat is. So this is a methodology that the DEP uses in a regulatory framework to assess uh, community health. I was involved in some work in which we applied this methodology, examining macroinvertebrates in a number of different springs in the St. John system. And just to give you a little bit of um, a data, um, this is what we call a species accumulation curve. It plots the, uh, num the cumulative number of species on the y-axis versus the number of samples um, that uh, these invertebrates are collected in. And you can see that these are different um, mathematical estimators. And you can see that in all cases, even approaching 30 samples, that um, the curves have not completely plateaued off, which mainly uh, or simply means that not all of the species present have been sampled in those 30 or more samples. And looking at it in a different way, is another um, uh, sort of mathematical relationship that associates the number of individuals uh, 
the total number of individuals of each species. So each of these dots represents an individual species are ranked in, in their order of abundance, um, in their decreasing order of abundance. <clears throat> and you'll notice especially that the y-axis is a logarithmic scale. So what this shows is that the uh, total number of organisms in these samples is, um, is dominated by relatively few species at the top of the graph here. These are the most numerically dominant and the vast majority of species are far less common than those dominant species. And this is a, 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 a typical phenomenon in eco, ecological sampling. So now I wanna turn away from uh, that survey of, um, of major macroinvertebrate groups and talk specifically about our subterranean fauna, which is dominated by, um, well, it's really limited to uh, aquatic species. And this is really a unique um, component of karst in Florida. If we look at uh, aquatic obligate cave dwelling species in the Eastern United States, you can see that there are two areas of, of geographic concentration, the interior highlands and the Appalachians in uh, the um, New Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, and then down in the coastal plain in Florida, we have this uh, aggregation of obligate cave dwelling organisms and we really have a unique subterranean fauna. This is a breakdown of what we call stigial biots. Um, troglobites are aquatic organisms that are confined, I'm sorry, are, are organisms that are confined to caves. And we refer to the aquatic troglobites as stigial biots. And so we, they fall into the, the um, three major categories here, crustaceans, mollusks, and vertebrates. In terms of the crustacean fauna, it's dominated by crayfish. We have one paleomanetid shrimp species, but there are also four isopods, two amphipods, and we have one a snail, um, stigiobion, and we have one a vertebrate, a salamander, and I'll show you a few of these examples. So here are some of the decapods. We have on the upper left, the Santa Fe cave crayfish, on the right, the spider cave crayfish, and the lower left, the squirrel chimney cave shrimp, which is probably extinct. It hasn't been seen for close to 40 years. But I wanna point out a few important features of our stigial biont fauna. First of all, you'll notice that these uh, cave animals typically lose their pigmentation and they typically have reduced eyes or, uh, or a complete loss of eyes. And of course, that's because having evolved in a, a perpetually dark environment, vision is, is no longer a, a necessary sensory adaptation. However, um, most of these cave organisms have evolved other means for sensing in their environment. So the extreme here, the spider cave crayfish has these very long spindle-like legs and long antennae that are used in a tactile manner to basically feel away in its environment. They also probably have highly evolved uh, chemosensory abilities. Here are examples of some of the other crustacean cave species. Uh, an amphipod on the left, an isopod on the right. And then our single vertebrate species, the Georgia blind salamander, which is found in Marianas, karst in southwestern Georgia and in the Florida panhandle in the area of Florida Cavern State Park. Again, you can see the loss of eyes, um, very delicate um, appendages and I'll just note in passing, although this is our only vertebrate um, of stigial biont here in Florida, in the Edwards Aquifer of Texas, there are additional salamanders that are found in subterranean environments. If we look at the distribution of our subterranean fauna on the left here, the rats represent individual cave systems and the black are the uh, circumscribed, the general distribution of these uh, stigiobion assemblages. And so you'll notice that they're um, concentrated in the Suwannee River Valley and the St. John Woodville Karst and up in the Panhandle. We do have one species of cave crayfish that's associated 
um, in South Florida and Miami. Um, but you'll notice in North Florida that the distribution of the stygibion assemblage largely corresponds with the areas of the aquifer that are unconfined or semi-confined. And this represents the situation in which um, historically the what we call the, um, um, the, the surficial fauna was able to penetrate into hypogean or subterranean habitats and it, where they then evolved into these unique, uh, these, these unique animals. Stygibionts have some very interesting life history attributes. First of all, they're very long lived and slow growing. They uh, live in th th these energy and nutrient limited environments, which relates to these life history attributes. They generally have low metabolic rates and they're tolerant of the low dissolved oxygen that occurs in these environments. And they also have relatively low fecundity or um, slow reproductive rates. So essentially they are living in somewhat of a, a, a state of suspended animation, if you will, compared to their epigean or their surface dwelling uh, ancestors. Now I wanna turn uh, my attention to another major group of organisms, of animals that occur in our habitats and of course, when visitors to springs don a uh, mask and snorkel and go underwater, they're immediately, of course, impressed by the fish fauna. So that will be the next group that I'll be talking about. But first of all, let me um, discuss briefly what are some of the major ecological roles of fishes. First of all, uh, these are key components of biodiversity in our springs and our spring fed streams. And they're important predators on invertebrates or on other fish. So they're intermediate to uh, higher within the uh, food chain. And of course, predation is an organizing force within these ecosystems. And as such, they also provide food for higher, uh, for organisms higher up in the trophic uh, web. Often when it comes to fish, people ask me, WTF, what's that fish? Well, fortunately we have uh, some um, good resources for identifying fish. This is a, a book that recently came out, which is serves as a good identification guide for all of our fishes in, in fresh waters within Florida, published by the University of Press with uh, colleagues at the Florida Museum, and at Florida Museum of Natural History. But I also wanna point out um, the Florida Springs Institute has been actively developing some uh, resources for identifying fish specifically within springs. And so the FSI has developed a number of different videos that are useful um, for assisting in identif identifying fish. So if you're interested, I encourage you to check out the website and look at some of the videos. So in surveying uh, some of the major groups of fish that occur in our sy spring systems, first of all, we have some very ancient lineages of fishes, such as the Gulf sturgeon, the bowfin, and the gars. Um, these are uh, lineages of fishes that date back for millions of years. We have a large number of um, members of the family Cyprinidae. These are commonly known as minnows and carps. Uh, this is the most diverse group of freshwater fish in eastern North America and in, in portions of Asia. Um, and I just want to point out uh, this particular fish in the lower left on a school on the lower right. This is called the red-eye chub and it's uh, as close to, um, um, it, it's a species that's fairly closely affiliated with our karst systems. They um, really require clean spring water. A group that is familiar to most people, especially anglers, are the centrarchids, the sunfishes, and the bass. So these are among the most um, diverse, as well as forming the greatest biomass of fishes within our spring systems. 
Here we have a red breast sunfish, a spotted sunfish, and a largemouth bass. A group of smaller fish that are largely um, distributed near the surface of the waters in our spring systems are the live bears or the pisaleas. Shown on the left are mosquito, uh, mosquito fish, in the upper right is a sailfin molly, and the lower right is a um, least killifish. These are sexually dimorphic fish. So in the case of the mosquito fish, the male on the top here and the female on the bottom, the males have this long developed anal fin called a gonopodium in which they uh, use to insert their gametes into the female and the females then become pregnant and uh, the developing young uh, develop within the ovary of the female and then are eventually born alive. So in this female mosquito fish, you can see this black spot here that uh, indicates the female is pregnant and those, uh, that black spot is actually the eye spots of the developing larvae. We also have uh, catfishes that occur. Um, this family, Icteluridae, is uh, a family of catfishes, the only family of catfishes that we have in fresh waters in, the, in North America. Um, in, in the case of Florida springs and rivers, we have things such as the channel catfish. This one in the middle is the spotted, uh, yeah, the spotted bullhead, which is limited in its distribution to the Suwannee River, the Ocklockney River, and the Apalachicola Chattahoochee River basin. We have at the bottom here the freckled mad tom. This is a fairly diverse group of uh, species within North America, and they're very secretive. We have a, a, what I'm just calling miscellaneous, a lot of different other families uh, that comprise groups that we can find in Florida Springs, such as the shads, the clupeids, the athronopsids, these are the silver sides, the elastomatids, pygmy sunfish, small, very beautiful uh, fish, the isosids, these are the pikes and pickerels. We have two species, the grass pickerel and red fin pickerel are common in our Ford spring habitats. The darters, this is the second most species rich group of fit freshwater fish in Eastern North America. And we have a number of different species of darters in, in our Ford springs. And then another group of surface dwelling um, fish, the fungulids or the top minnows. And then we also have a number of different species that we refer to as marine invaders. These are uh, fish that we typically think are associated mostly with marine habitats, but they commonly penetrate into and occur in Florida freshwater habitats. So things such as the mullet on the upper left, we have gobies, needlefish in the middle, um, gray snapper on the lower left, and uh, this sole called the hog choker. These are a few examples of some of the marine invaders in our Florida spring systems. And here are some additional ones. We have things such as Atlantic stingrays. There's a resident population of Atlantic stingray that occur in the St. John's, particularly in the uh, Lake George area. And they commonly move into some of uh, those associated springs such as um, salt springs. We have some examples of species marine invaders that come to us from primarily from the Caribbean. Things such as the mountain mullet shown here in the upper right and the river goby shown here. Uh, these are species whose distribution is predominantly in the Caribbean, but they do make it into, into southeastern, in the southeastern U.S. and into our spring systems. One group of uh, also notable interest are the pipe fishes. We have resident populations of Gulf pipefish that occur in the Santa Fe Basin uh, or in the Santa Fe River within the Suwannee and also in the St. John's. And this is a, a group that's of particular interest to me. Um, the pipefishes are related to seahorses. And this group of fishes are the only fishes that in which the male becomes pregnant. Um, so they're model organisms for, for that reason. We also have a few species of fish that move back and forth between freshwater and saltwater, and these fall into two different categories. Species that we call anadromous, those are fish um, species that 
spawn within fresh water, but then migrate to the salt water. And they may do this seasonally or over the course of their entire lifespan. So things such as the Gulf sturgeon, uh, the Alabama shad and the striped bass. And in contrast, we have what we refer to as catadromous species. The single catadromous species we have is the American eel. This species then spawns in salt water, but lives most of its life in fresh water. So it has this fairly complex life cycle that's very interesting. The adults spawn in an area of the Northwestern Atlantic called the Sargasso Sea off of the Bahamas. <clears throat> Once they spawn, the eggs then hatch and develop into these um, small um, leptocephali larvae shown here. These are planktonic. They drift in the plankton and eventually they metamorphose into what's called a glass eel near the shore of Eastern North America here. And then they develop into an elver, which then begins its migration into the river system where these uh, eels then mature. So in uh, our river systems in Eastern North America, they may live for anywhere from about five to eight years where they um, feed and they eventually mature and migrate back out to the Sargasso Sea where the adults spawn and die. <clears throat> so this very complex life cycle. And I'll just throw a pitch in here for a book that I recently read that's a marvelous book to read called The Book of Eels by Patrick Svensson. This actually is about the European eel, not the American eel, but the American and European eels have a very uh, a similar life history. And um, it's a, a very worthwhile book to read if you're interested in, in learning more about the fascinating life history of eels. So I wanna just uh, talk a little bit about um, species, um, studies of species of fish within some of our systems. These are data from a survey that I conducted um, probably 20 years ago by now, uh, surveying fish fauna in various different springs in, in some of our North Florida state parks. You can see this is uh, the number of fish species on the y-axis in different spring systems. And you can see that's the quite, quite a range in terms of overall numbers of, of species that are present. You'll notice that the, the greatest number is usually in our large magnitude springs and particularly those that have direct connections um, or semi-direct connections to the, to the marine environment. And so those marine invaders really add to the total overall number of species. And if we look at a breakdown, these are data for just a select number of springs in the St. John systems. And if we look at a taxonomic breakdown, you'll see there's really only a few families that dominate. So these five families up here dominate well over three quarters of the total abundance of fish with uh, much uh, less abundant um, are these other 18 other families. So many of our uh, historical studies were really qualitative in terms of uh, uh, fish communities, but in recent years, scientists have begun more quantitative studies on fish communities in our spring system. So these are some data from uh, work done by investigators at Stetson University in Volusia Blue Springs, where they sampled over several years along uh, uh, the spring run near the spring head and along the spring run. They sampled seasonally um, to uh, enumerate the, the fish fauna. And you can see the graph on the right here shows the total density of um, all fish species across these different stations with station one being near the head spring and then down towards the mouth in the St. Johns River station five. And you can see there's a trend of uh, greater abundance overall in the uh, head spring area and then as moving down the spring run, lower abundance. And also you'll see a little bit of inter, uh, interannual, intraannual variation. Um, this dominance of abundance at the head spring is really part, primarily due to uh, the preponderance of some of the small species that I've already mentioned, the um, top minnows and the, and the live bearers. These reach very high 
densities. In, an, in another recent study, um, uh, ecologists with the Southwest Water Management, Southwest Florida Water Management District have begun to do some quantitative surveys in some of the springs along the Springs Coast. And so these are data from the uh, Rainbow River recently published. Um, so this is the Rainbow River on the left with the head spring area up here and then flowing down towards the Gulf of Mexico here. And these biologists sampled in a number of different transects from the head spring down or from near the head spring down river. And these are some of the data that uh, resulted. So up in the right hand um, graphic is a, um, a multivariate ordination. This, that, uh, each of the dots represents different transects. And so these are the abundances of different fishes. And what you see are there are just two groupings here, what's referred to as zone one, the upper river, and zone two, the lower river. So there's a real dichotomy in terms of the fish community, um, in terms of fish community and abundance between the upper portion of the Rainbow River and the lower portion of the Rainbow River. And uh, that's the, the species that dominate in each of those systems or each of those portions of the system um, are represented in the lower graph. So this is the percent composition. So in terms of the upper river, these are the species that dominate a spotted sunfish in particular. It's, and you can see just along the, the um, the y-axis, what those species are. In terms of the lower river, these are the species, some of our centrarchids in particular. Okay, then I want to turn away from fish and talk just very briefly about some of the other um, uh, animals that we associate with Florida Springs, beginning with amphibians and reptiles. Um, this is a, a great uh, book that was just recently published on amphibians and reptiles of Florida, and it's a has a wealth of information for people who might be particularly in, interested in turtles. There's this other book uh, that summarizes pretty much everything you would want to know about the biology and conservation of turtles within the state. So just uh, again a, a photographic survey of some of the uh, amphibians and reptiles that we have in our spring systems. These are some of the frogs, the river frogs shown on the lower right. This is as much of a, a, a lodic amphibian that we have that is one associated with flowing waters. And I, I'd like to also just point out, of course, that many of these animals, including many of the fish species I showed you, but a lot of the um, amphibians and reptiles and um, birds, as I'll get to in a few minutes, um, are not obviously exclusively limited to the, these karst habitats, um, but I'm just highlighting some of the ones that are important components within our karst systems. So we also have salamanders such as the siren and the amphiumas. And we really have um, a uh, important turtle fauna the southeastern United States has the, um, the most diverse turtle fauna in the world, uh, well, maybe the second most between the southeastern United States and southeastern Asia. These are the two areas of the world that have the greatest um, freshwater turtle diversity. And of course, in Florida, um, associated with our karst habitats, we have uh, some, some important turtle communities. And so these are some of the turtles that we have, um, the, the musk, the loggerhead, the softshell turtles, the sliders and the cooters, the uh, alligator snapping turtles, uh, all thought to have been only one species, but recently biologists have determined that there are actually three different species. We also of course have snakes including non-venomous and venomous, the water snakes of the genus uh, Nerodia, a number of different species, and of course our notorious cottonmouth. And these um, water snakes and ribbon snakes, the water snakes and the, and the ribbon snakes, garter snakes are what we refer to as natricines. 
that's just the, the general group that snake, that herpetologists refer to them as. And of course, uh, we would be negligent if we didn't mention alligators. Alligators, of course, being an important um, animals, not only in spring systems, but in many different types of aquatic habitats in Florida and the Southeast coastal plain. And of course, birds are also an important um, component that we associate with, uh, with our karst habitats. And last but not least, of course, the Florida manatee. Um, many people visit many of our springs almost uh, entirely just to observe manatees, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, if that's the only reason they come and they don't appreciate many of the other uh, animals that we have. But um, there's this recent book published, um, well, not so recent, about 10 years ago, uh, on the biology of the manatee, summarizes um, really everything that we uh, know about manatee biology and conservation. Now I wanna turn my attention to discuss invasive species because invasive species are becoming a, a, an additional problem in, in our spring habitats and in our aquatic habitats in general. Of course, Florida is one of the poster childs for invasive species in terms of the Everglades. Um, but unfortunately in North Central Florida, um, we're, we're encountering greater problems with invasive species uh, in, in, in our karst habitats. And these are some examples, tilapia on the upper left, grass carp, the armored catfish of a couple of different groups that I'm gonna discuss more, things like uh, these, big, um, these big apple snails. So beginning with a little bit of discussion about the armored catfish. Armored catfish have just exploded in uh, aquatic systems throughout Florida and, and they're very um, uh, obvious in some of our spring systems such as this large aggregation in Alexander Springs shown at the top. Um, in the Santa Fe system, we've done some work and we see a lot of variation and there may be some um, hybridization going on with, um, with the different species that have been introduced. From an ecological perspective, um, these catfish can uh, um, pr present different problems. The males burrow into the substrate, so you can see um, these exposed burrows and these um, these burrows in some areas may destabilize banks or have other physical impacts. But they're not just physical impacts to the environment. These uh, fish also have physical impacts or, or, uh, and biological impacts to um, the, the, the other animals that live in these habitats. And so with manatees, we're seeing this situation where in some of our spring systems, manatees are being um, bothered by, by these armored catfish. And so I have a show, short video that I wanna show um, that uh, was put together um, by a news station in Orlando uh, based on some of the work that uh, Dr. Missy Gibbs at Stetson University, who's been studying the, the impacts of these invasive car armored catfish. So hopefully this video will play. Catfish that are killing manatees. A local professor is now on a mission to save them. The new station's Lara Greenberg reports. Once a month, Dr. Melissa Gibbs jumps into Blue Springs and spears as many of these armored catfish latching onto the manatee as she can, killing them because they are manatee killers. Watch as this manatee thrashes to get the fish off of it. And they've got these very soft, um, suckery mouths, and so they latch onto the manatees and start grazing the algae off of their skin. Here's what's going on beneath the surface. The manatees are trying so hard to shake these annoying catfish, it causes the manatee to be constantly moving, in turn burning more calories, which could ultimately lead to the demise of the manatee. They have to go out into the really cold river more frequently, and they're at risk of cold shock, which can kill them. These catfish, just some of the invasive species that feed off Florida's natural habitat, Florida is a hotspot for invasive species. It's 
a real problem that so many things have been brought to Florida and set free. People started buying armored catfish from the Amazon basin to eat the algae in their fish tanks at home. But then they get too big for their fish tanks. Mm -hmm. A full size one can be two feet long. Um, so when they get too big, they release them. Into the wild, where they eat the algae off manatees' backs and grow bigger and bigger. These armored catfish reproduce so much and so fast that these manatees are basically no match for them. Imagine um, 30,000 or more eggs being laid by a single female in a single summer. Dr. Gibbs has speared more than 8,000 armored catfish, but the fact is... We are not going to get rid of the armored catfish. I mean, they are here to stay unfortunately. But so is Dr. Gibbs. She'll keep hunting the invasive catfish, protecting Florida's beloved manatee, and keeping the always treasured blue springs as beautiful and serene as it deserves to be. It feels awfully good to, to be doing something. Larry Greenberg, Fox 35 News. Okay, so um, so these armored catfish have an impact on manatees, but we also see a situation in which um, some of our native organisms actually use these catfish and things like tilapia as well, which are also invasive as, as, as prey, um, particularly some of our waterfowl. But there may be other consequences in terms of some of these invasive uh, fish. So here's an illustration of a white pelican with a large tilapia in its pouch. It's um, unknown to me whether or not this pelican would be able to swallow that or not. Obviously, some of these birds are capable of, um, of, 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 of taking very large prey, but uh, they do, I think, in some cases, um, uh, meet up with, with potentially negative consequences. So here's another example. This is a series of images that were taken of a uh, great blue heron that captured one of these armored, these armored self and catfish. This was down near Lake Apopka. And you can see on the upper left, the, the heron has captured the catfish, but it has to manipulate it to get it into a position in which it might be able to swallow it. So it does that, it's in the lower left, flipping it around, and finally in the upper right, it's got it at least head first oriented towards its mouth. But these catfish, as most anglers will tell you or are aware, these and most other catfish have the ability to lock their pectoral spines and to lock their dorsal fin spines into an erect position, and these are very rigid spines. And once that happens, then it becomes uh, virtually impossible given the size, at least in this particular case, given the size of the fish for the bird to swallow it. And the photographer who took these pictures uh, stated that um, this bird manipulated this fish for about 30 minutes before it finally gave up and realized it was not going to be able to swallow it. So. The bottom line is that uh, these invasive species that we are seeing a greater preponderance of may, um, they may have negative consequences um, in many different ways. So I'll um, finish up with just a little uh, final discussion about, um, about that aspect of predation. Of course, alligators we think of as top predators and there's no doubt that alligators can consume uh, these fish. But thinking about alligators as top consumers in spring systems just brings me to a last couple of data slides. This is some information that was based on some work done by scientists associated with the University of Florida and with the St. John's River Water Management District. This was part of a large study in the Silver Springs system in which uh, biologists were interested in studying the, the trophic web, what's going on. And, and they were doing this using stable isotopes. So we have stable isotopes on the y-axis here, stable isotopes of nitrogen, and on the x-axis, stable isotopes of carbon. And in these studies that scientists 
do with stable isotopes, they can evaluate various different aspects about uh, the food web. And you get this general relationship um, in the relationship between stable nitrogen and stable carbon where you have primary producers near the bottom left and then moving up the food chain towards the top predators, this typical sort of a, um, a trend. So these biologists uh, studying organisms in the Silver River sampled all sorts of different animals and evaluated um, their, their stable isotope signatures. And these are the results of that uh, study. So each of these different symbols represents some different type of organism. We have both uh, primary producers such as algae and then we have some of the invertebrate groups that I mentioned. And you do see this general trend, of course, from the primary producers up to the top predators. But the interesting thing is if you look at alligators, this is where alligators fell out. So we have adult alligators, juvenile alligators, and subadult alligators, and they're not really at the top of the chart. They're somewhere in the middle. And so what this indicates, to me at least, is that even though we typically think of alligators as um, top predators, they really are very um, omnivorous. They eat a variety of prey. And I've seen so myself in looking at alligator stomach contents. They eat small fish, they eat even crayfish, uh, invertebrates, and they'll eat um, larger vertebrates. So that was an interesting um, study done in, in Silver River. And with that, uh, that's all I have. So I will plan to attend the question and answer session on March 14th, and I will be available for anyone who might have any questions about our fauna in Florida Springs. Thank you.